All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning for our first uh, revised Net Squared event for Adelaide. Um, so my name is Ryan, um, one of the, the local Net Squared organisers and was involved a very long time ago with Ben, who you can see on the call as well, when Net Squared first launched in Adelaide. Um, just before we, we start and Kat introduces our guest for today, I just want to quickly share my screen and just explain a little bit about NetSquared and what it's all about and, and why, uh, why we think this is a good thing to bring back to Adelaide. Um, so NetSquared is a program of TechSoup. Um, if you don't know what TechSoup is, it's a funny name for a global network of nonprofits that um, work to support other nonprofits and, and help them do their work better. Um, so our local Net Squared organisers in Adelaide and Darwin are myself and Kat. Um, so Net Squared, program of TechSoup, Net Squared is basically a global network of tech for good meetup. So we're all about how we can use uh, technology to help the positive parts of the world. Um, and then as it says on the slide, TechSoup is a nonprofit that helps other nonprofits get, implement, and use technology effectively. Um, so the NetSquared Global Network very aligned with the TechSoup Global Network. So you can see we had a a lot of countries. Wow. 41 countries. Eli, this probably isn't even up to date, I reckon. You probably got some more countries lurking under your under your couch cushions. Well, COVID has thrown you know the spanner into the works for many things, <laughs> but uh, largely true. Yeah, so we we might be a program of NetSquared, but uh, of TechSoup Global, but locally NetSquared organisers are volunteers running these as community meetups. But we get some good resources from TechSoup, like the support of Eli and um, the the great platform that we're using for the event bookings. Um, so uh, the Net Squared community values, we welcome everyone. Um, we put community first, so we're here to support each other. Um, you know, we don't want people in here trying to sell things. Um, we build stronger nonprofits. Now technology is one of the tools that can be used to do that, but it's really nice that the first presentation we've got this year from Jonas is uh, less about the technology and, and more about um, other tools to strengthen nonprofits. Um, we invite participation. So in, in a couple of slides, we're, we're open to, if anyone wants to get involved in, in running NetSquared, then reach out. Um, and we treat each other with kindness and respect. Um, so uh, we do, um, as I said, it's a community event. So um, if we have people who want to get involved in running NetSquared or anyone that can benefit from the experience of being involved, um, if you're in Adelaide, you can get involved with, with Kat and I, with, with running the local group. Um, if you're not in Adelaide, you can get involved by chatting to Eli about the NetSquared group in your town or if you don't have a NetSquared group in your town, starting one. Um, so if you haven't heard of TechSoup, you may locally have heard of Connecting Up. So Connecting Up are the local TechSoup partner in Australia. Um, they're actually based in, in Adelaide uh, and they are the, the arm that helps nonprofits with their technology donations locally. Um, so people like Microsoft, I actually thought I'd never do this again, Ben, but People like Microsoft, Autodesk, um, Box, Google, they provide technology donations through Connecting Up and they help nonprofits access those donations. Um, and then if you need help with that technology, either reach out to Connecting Up or TechSoup have a forum that you can go to and get advice and experience from other nonprofits. All right, um, locally your sponsors, uh, Refuel Creative, which is where I'm from, and Create Your Change, which is where Kat's from. Um, we have volunteering our time 
uh, and resources to make sure these events happen. And with that said, I will hand over to Kat to introduce today's guest. Thank you, Ryan. I am so excited to be here and even more excited to have Jonas Kane on the, the webinar with us this morning to kick off the reimagining of NetSquared here in Adelaide. I cannot imagine a more perfect person to talk about positivity and to get everything going. I've known Jonas, I've actually lost track of how long I've known Jonas. Um, I knew him when he was a professional magician and a darn good one at that. And it's been an amazing thing to watch his evolution as a human performance consultant, positivity coach, experience designer, and facilitator, as he says, a facilitator of fascination. His company, Hashtag Positivity, literally reaches around the world to lift others up and to help them have a more positive outlook on life. He has authored 10 books, some of which I don't own yet. I need to do something about that. And is the host of On a Positive Note podcast and also produces a free weekly coaching series to help enhance clarity, confidence, courage, and joy. So it is my a distinct honor and privilege and pleasure to introduce you to my very good and dear friend, Jonas Kane. Thank you so much, Kat, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you just for having me. I'm so happy that you and everyone is here. I'm coming to you from my home uh, office in Holyoke, Massachusetts in the United States. And I'm just thrilled that you're all here for this very special live edition of On a Positive Note. For, as Kat just said, I have a podcast called On a Positive Note. Check it out, onapositivenote.com. Uh, and those episodes are all pre-recorded and they're out in the world. But you folks, because you registered and have said yes to this and are attending, you are the only ones who will get to experience what we're about to, to, uh, to, to talk about today. So I'm so happy you're here. Uh, just the other day, uh, we had, uh, actually, before, before I say this, I, I have a question for, for you folks. I'm taking vociferous notes over here. I encourage all of you to do the same thing. If you have a piece of paper or if you have a note-taking app on your computer, tablet, or phone, I encourage you to take notes as we go along. I have a question, and I'd like you to write down your thoughts on your answer to this. And the question is this. Have you ever said yes to something that later on you wished you had said no to? Have you ever said yes when you wish you would have said no? And as a follow-up related question, have you ever said yes to too many things? Just jot down a sentence or two about your experience with this. And the reason I even bring this up is the other day here in the United States was Super Bowl Sunday. I don't know if anyone outside of the United States really cares about Super Bowl Sunday, but it's a pretty big deal in the United States. <laughs> Kat says, no, no one cares. <laughs> uh, but every time uh, the Super Bowl comes around, I think about an experience I had years ago with the Super Bowl. And the experience was when I was invited to not one, but several Super Bowl parties. And I made, I mean, how blessed am I to have so many loved ones in my life? Let's just stop and appreciate that, right? But let's also uh, notice and recognize a critical error that I made. I said yes to all of them. And there's a problem to saying yes to so many things. One, you're never going to get to actually enjoy the game <laughs> because you're going to spend most of your time going to and from different parties. And two, you're not even going to be able to enjoy the company with the people that you're with because you're already going to be thinking about where you're supposed to go next. And every time, and this is so true in so many aspects of our lives, every time we say yes to something, that's the same as saying no to anything and everything else we, we could be doing. And in a similar way, every time we say no to something, that's the same as saying yes to all the potential possibilities. A positive practice then is to be mindful of what we're saying yes and no to 
that with great clarity, focus our attention on the behaviors that truly matter most. Because without this clarity of focus, we run the risk of falling victim to what's called an external locus of control, where we release control of our lives and we'll never achieve what we most desire because we've released control of our experiences. And yet, when we do have this clarity of focus, we'll find that we'll always maintain control of our experiences because few things in life are more powerful than a life lived with passionate clarity. And that, my friends, is the heart of what we're talking about to hear, here today on this special live edition of On a Positive Note. We're going to unpack the three pillars of positivity. These are accurate, accessible, and actionable principles and practices that you can apply to, to your work, to your life at home, your personal and professional lives, to your community, and beyond. If you've kept track of the latest trends in positivity, which I do constantly, I'm constantly looking up the latest articles and in, in research on, on this topic, you'll, you're likely going to find that positivity often has a negative rap. Uh, there's a, a slew of, of articles out there talking about what they call toxic positivity, where this excessive focus on positivity and on being happy is actually causing more harm than good. And their arguments are valid when we're, when, when we're talking about that kind of positivity, where we just throw on rose-colored glasses and pretend everything is fine, when we just sweep everything under the rug and throw everything into a closet so our lives look like they're great, but our lives are still a mess in reality. It's not very positive when we are focusing on being nice and doing what we think people want us to do or saying what, you, we, what we think people will want, want to hear. What we're talking about instead is about choosing to be kind, doing what needs to be done, even the hard stuff, saying what needs to be said, even the things that are difficult to say. The three pillars of positivity that we're going to unpack in just a moment. So I encourage you to get out your piece of paper, your note-taking app. These are accurate, accessible, and actionable principles and practices that you can hone in and focus on. We can just focus on these three pillars. And if you have strengths in each of these core areas, oh my goodness, they can have exponential growth in your life. So I'm just going to outline them really quickly and then we'll unpack them so get your pens and papers ready the first pillar of positivity is mindset the second pillar of positivity is purpose and the third pillar of positivity is relationships And real quick, I'll just explain a little bit about each one. Mindset, specifically, we're referring to a growth mindset, where we believe in our ability to learn new knowledge and gain new skills. And it also refers to an internal locus of control rather than an external locus of control, where we believe we have the ability to, to influence our experiences. So that's mindset. Number two is purpose. And this is having clarity of purpose, where your life has direction. You wake up every day excited. You have something to aim for. And this is the key, something to look forward to. Mindset helps us to stay grounded in the present moment, but purpose gives us something to look forward to as well. And lastly, relationships. This is about the, the positive social support that we surround ourselves with. They can help celebrate with us when times are good, but they can also help pick us up and remind us of our value even when, when we've forgotten it. So before we dive headfirst into each of these pillars, I invite you once again to just jot down your thoughts about which pillar is your rock, which pillar is, you know, you're already an expert in that you know that you're solid in. Acknowledge where your strength lies with these pillars, but also acknowledge where you could use some work. 
if you want, you can um, you can quantify this maybe on a scale of one to five, say, you know, where five is you're really strong, one is where <laughs> you need a lot of work. And do that for each of these three pillars. And after you have jotted down a few things, I'm just curious if you're willing, I'm not going to force you, but if you're willing, put in the chat box, what your what pillar is your strength? And then put in the chat box what your weakness is. And I encourage you to do this because we have, oh, how many people do we have in this session? I think we have seven people here. And we're going to, oh, we, we have eight now. Sarah just came in. Hello, Sarah. It's good to have you. What we'll find is some people's strength is someone else's weaknesses and some someone's weakness will be someone else's strength. So I encourage you to share with 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 one another i have things i'll be sharing but along the way if you have questions or comments you wish to share i encourage you to put them in the chat box and we can address those and perhaps other uh, attendees can ad address them as well let's see checking out question have you ever said yes oh yep so cat put in i'm just seeing all these comments now strengths relationships that's great, Eli, in, in weakness mindset. That's, that's a big one for a lot of folks. Cat uh, still working and growing with mindset and purpose. So I, I will say this though about you, Kat. I've known you, it seems like it's been forever. You, I can say you are certainly strong in your in your relationship. So, so that is that is a great point. Vicky, uh, strength, mindset, weakness, relationship. So that's a great pairing there. And then Ben, mindset is your strength, weakness is relationships. Uh, let's see, Sarah, I need a moment to pick up on what's going on. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, Sarah. Hello. So let me explain what, what's happening here. We're going over the three pillars of positivity, mindset, is having having uh, having a growth mindset. You can gain new knowledge and skills. You have an ex you have an internal locus of control. You you have a control and influence over your experiences. Purpose. You have something to look forward to, something to aim for. In relationships, you have positive social support that can lift you up in times of trouble and celebrate with you when times are good. All right. So we have lots of great responses here. And I'm curious to know to, to the, the moderators, if there's any way we might be able to save this chat, because because I'd like to, there, there's a lot to go through here. I'm seeing the head nods, great. It's going to be recorded and distributed out and I'll be sending you a copy, Jonas. Fantastic, thank you so much, Kat. All right, well, we have just gained a, 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 a pulse on our strengths and our weaknesses in these areas. We're gonna dive right in now with mindset. And I'm going to share my screen because on this screen I have, oh, how many, oh, that's the wrong one. Oh, or is it the right, what is the right one? Yes, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We have eight words, fascination, inspiration, motivation, positivity, joy, kindness, empathy, and confidence. These are all words that we can qualify them as, as positive words. These are words that if we focus on them, and I see kindness is right, right in there. That's that's one of the of the values of, of net squared, kindness and respect, right? So, so the, these are words, if we focus, facilitate positive experiences for each other, empathy, confidence, these are all positive things. In a moment, we're going to go into the proverbial mine. It's said that that miners, when they go into a mine, they have to sift through tons of dirt just to find a single ounce of gold. The secret is they don't go in looking for the dirt. They go in looking for the gold. So these words, these are our gold. And the mine is a it's a word search. So the next screen I'm going to share, it is a word search. And your mission as a positivity miner is to go into this word search looking for as many of these words as you can. And the, these words will be on the screen next to the, 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 the puzzle, so you don't have to worry about not being able to find them. I'm but Here's the catch. I am putting only 30 seconds on the clock. So you only have 30 seconds. Your mission 
is to collect as much gold, collect as much positivity as you can in these words. So I'm going to stop this screen. I'm going to share the puzzle now in three, two, and oh, oh wrong one, wrong one. <laughs> and go, here it is. <laughs> Five seconds. All right, and that alarm means <laughs> we are done. All right, put in the chat box, how many words did you find? Did you find one, two, three, four, all of them, four. Oh, Cat found nine. Oh, oh nine. Whoa, that, that's catch a star. Wonderful. She is a star seven five four all right so i, just I, I leaning into negativity i'm like i guess i'm just going to keep on looking at that over and over again <laughs> wait a second who just said that was that was that eli it was so so eli so what word did you find i just looked at negativity and then i just kept on reading it over and over again i'm like i guess that's the thing i'm going to dwell in today and and let's be honest here you did you you have stumbled on to the true lesson here and, and i think cat did too if she found nine words is that uh there are more words in this puzzle than just these gold nuggets than just uh these these positive words but there are an equal number of positive words as negative words and so oh and oh my goodness you latched right on to that negative word and this goes right into research by psychologists. They have found that humans have what's called a negativity bias, where, uh, where they just latch onto what's wrong with our lives and what's missing from our lives. And we just sort of brush off the good things. And, they, and they, they have speculation as to why this is, but really who knows anything about anything. But they say it's because uh, when our ancestors thousands of, of years ago, if they didn't focus on threats, they would get eaten by a tiger or they would starve to death. So if you didn't focus on threats, then you were in a lot of trouble. The problem is we're living in a modern world being interpreted through an ancient brain. Our evolution hasn't quite caught up with us yet. If, if we believe uh, what's going on in the research, there's this fantastic book by Steven Pinker called the uh, the better angels of our nature the world is actually doing much better than we think if all we do is listen to the news and <laughs> the the negativity on social media you wouldn't believe it but the world is actually much safer than it used to be uh, but we have this negativity bias and they say our brains it's kind of like like a a, a spotlight attached to a vacuum cleaner what our mind focuses on, what it gives attention to, it shines a light on it so we can't see anything else. But because of the vacuum cleaner, it shoots it up into us, right? So it's this idea that what we give our attention to, we latch onto. And, and Eli, unfortunately, you just latched right onto that negativity literally right away. <laughs> uh, so the secret, again, is in this puzzle, there were more positive words. There were there was an equal number of positive words as negative words. However, you likely found more positive words than negative words because that's what you went in looking for. And I see Ben says that he saw courage, but then it turned into discouragement. Well, that's interesting because it was always discouragement, but you latched onto the positive side. In in any situation, yes, we could we could look at the downside for why everything's wrong, or we can look at the positive side for look at the opportunities, even within these struggles, right? So that's the idea here. We found more positive words than negative words. Oh, Karen found an equal number of positive and negative. You know what that means, Karen? I think what that means, high five, you are just a very aware person, <laughs> which is very unique. That's something that, uh, that I, um, 
I get what I call what, what's called cognitive overload. I just get overloaded. I have to limit things. I have to, I literally put my phone on airplane mode so I'm not getting notifications, you know, because I just get overloaded. But that is a special skill to have, Karen, in only 30 seconds. Kudos. So we get what we get what we focus on is the moral of the story. If we want positive experiences, then we could focus on the opportunities. If we want negative experiences, and let's be honest, sometimes we do. Who, who, who doesn't love a pity party from every now and again? But if we're ready for something more, then we can get it. There are uh, three quotes I'd like to share with you. Viktor Frankl, Napoleon Hill, and my personal favorite, the comedian Stephen Wright. And these quotes are all different, but they all speak towards the same thing. Viktor Frankl says, when we're not able to change our circumstances, we become challenged to change ourselves. And isn't that a great example of uh, going into the gold mine, looking for the gold rather than the dirt? It doesn't change the fact that you're surrounded by dirt, but it changes what we're focusing on, changing our focus. Napoleon Hill said, the worst thing that can happen to you may be the best thing for you, so long as you don't let it get the best of you. And uh, I, I, I've heard from a number of, of folks before that they said that's one of their favorite quotes, so I'm going to repeat it again. <laughs> the worst thing that can happen to you may be the best thing for you, so long as you don't let it get the best of you. This is a tough one because some negative experiences are really heavy. Some situations are truly heavy. I um, uh, I met a woman once where she, it, it was this elderly woman, and I, I'm a terrible judge of age. So, you know, I'd say she, maybe give or take a few years, she was about 102 or 103 years old. I don't know. I'm terrible. I'm a terrible judge of age. She was probably 80 or something. I don't know. Uh, but she she was choking on, on her food. And even though she was able to cough up her food okay, she was fine. She was visibly distraught by this. It was this traumatic experience for her, every, though, even though everything was fine. And the reason it was so uh, traumatic for her is not long earlier, just maybe a couple weeks earlier, she also choked on her food. And she said that time it was... It was even worse. She couldn't cough up her food. She literally couldn't breathe. And her husband said her face had started to turn gray. Someone nearby had to perform the Heimlich on her and just pounding away at this frail hundred something year old woman. And probably before what has been too late, finally, <gasps> finally it dislodged and she was able to breathe. And they were afraid that even though she could breathe fine, that maybe she broke some ribs because, you know, you, she, she, you know she, she was this frail woman. So they brought her to the hospital to do some tests and x-rays and whatever it is doctors do. They didn't find any broken ribs. But what they did find is the reason I'm sharing this story right now. They found an aneurysm that was about to burst. Here's this... 90, 100 something odd year old woman. She lived it in her entire life. She went through this terrible near death experience. And yet, that near death experience prolonged her life. If she didn't have that experience, then it, she surely would have died sooner. It can be said that there's nothing good about tragedy that it's better to be happy than sad. It's better to be at peace than chaos. It's better to swallow our food rather than, than to choke on it. But just as choking on a piece of food can have a greater purpose in our lives, I would suggest that perhaps, perhaps there's something to what Napoleon says, that the worst thing that can happen to you may be the best thing for you, so long as you don't let it get the best of you. A a, this this happened also to a friend of mine more recently, where he he threw out his back golfing. They brought him to the, the hospital to get like you know some you know whatever it is doctors do to fix you up, and turns out they discovered he had very early they had caught it early early thyroid cancer, and 
he 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 never would have gone to the hospital and say, hey, check out if I have cancer. But here's this this experience. No one wants to experience their back going out. I've had my back go out, and it's painful. <laughs> and yet they was able to catch something that if he if it, it didn't happen, it surely would have been a, a worse experience. So what we're going to do now. I encourage you to get your piece of paper out and think about an experience from your past. It could be big, it could be small, it could be as simple as getting stuck in a traffic jam or maybe stubbing your toe, or it could be a big thing. Think about a negative experience that was that was that was difficult for you to handle at the time. And think about how it made you feel. Think about, of course, um, the different emotions surrounding it. And just jot down in just a few words, a sentence or two, what that experience was. I won't ask you to share it because, of course, these, these sort of things are personal. But what I will invite you to do, I'll invite you to play what the the author Eleanor H. Porter calls the glad game. There's a 1913 book called Pollyanna, where the title character, Pollyanna, I see Karen shaking her head. Have you read this book, Karen? Uh, so, so you've probably heard of this game of uh, of the glad game. Pollyanna has become so synonymous with this uh, overly optimistic person that the term Pollyanna now refers to someone who is optimistic. So the, the idea of the glad game is you think of something unfortunate, you find a way to be glad about it. And the example, and, and Karen, you'll of course remember this, uh, the experience that Pollyanna shared early on was how her father bought a doll for her, but instead of a doll, the shop sent a pair of crutches. <laughs> and what kid expecting a doll wants a pair of crutches? So she played the glad game and she thought about it and she realized, I'm just glad that I don't need the crutches. It doesn't matter how silly it is or how small it is, finding something to latch on to, to find the opportunity. So, so I encourage you, whatever you just wrote down, think about what the opportunity was to find a way, something to latch on to, to be glad about. Uh, of course, with the choking woman, she was just glad that, uh, that, that they were able to catch the, uh, the aneurysm. My, my friend who, his back went out, he was glad that they, they, they caught the cancer. Uh, I've been glad before that, um, uh, for instance, this was a number of years ago, I lost uh, a lot of work during the recession and I was glad that it, that gave me free time to work on my more creative endeavors. Yes, I lost a lot of money in my business, but it gave me a lot of free time to get more creative and develop more clarity of what I really want to be doing. It's amazing how much they say experience is a great teacher, but that's only partially true because it's really reflective experience that is a great potential teacher. So, so having, having time to pause and reflect and really focus our attention on what truly matters most, much like we were talking about right up at the top of the hour. So by now, I, I, I hope you've, you've had an opportunity to jot down a few thoughts about something you're glad about. Before we move on uh, to the next pillar, I would like to just acknowledge that this is, of course, easier said than done. Even me, I like to think of myself as Mr. Positivity, <laughs> Mr. Positivity, but even me, I find myself often uh, getting caught up with the hustle and bustle of everyday life. Things get heavy. It's easy to forget. But really building into your days moments to reflect and really remind yourself of this will certainly make this easier. And before we move on, I'd, I'd like to also check back into the chat box to see if there's any questions that anyone has. Let's see. Uh, oh, did Eli have to leave? Okay, I'm just seeing that now. 
So Karen, you've been playing it since a child. That's wonderful. I'm giving you a, a high five from afar. This is an international high five. Let's see. Uh, my, okay, this is Cap. My husband gets annoyed with me for always trying to see a positive in every situation. Uh, and I've met Paul. He's a he's a delightful man. He is a delight. He is a delightful man. But uh, but. Yeah, you know that I think that goes to back to what we we're talking about earlier about the toxic positivity in the sense that some people, uh, it's it can be a trigger for some people. You know, some people have those triggers where uh, perhaps who knows uh, what, what their past experiences were, but maybe they were once told to shove their um their their emotions down and, and not focus on their on their problems which again is um not the kind of positivity that we're talking about not sweeping things under the rug but really focusing facing things head on uh so some people might just have a misconception about what we mean so that's a possibility all right i don't see anything else coming in so let's dive back oh sarah i am going to have to, oh sarah's leaving oh my goodness well well sarah uh it, it's a pleasure to have you sarah's glad about a growing community of people interested in understanding how the mind works freeing ourselves this is wonderful she loved the quotes thank you and you're welcome feeling torn between learning and practical work Commitments, yes, that is a huge challenge. So for those of you who don't know, I'm running my own business, hashtag positivity. I'm also enrolled full-time in a graduate program studying education at Purdue University. So balancing education, learning, balancing running a business, uh, balancing so many things. And, and, and I also just signed a long-term contract working in a local high school uh, with with students. So it's easy to get torn between all these different responsibilities, which is why more than ever, it's so important to really build in those moments of grounding, reflection, and self-care, to focus on the gold nuggets, acknowledging the dirt, organizing your dirt, and in, in, in seeing perhaps if we can uh, sh shine some of that dirt, because, because maybe hidden within that dirt is the gold. Oh, I see Kat is saying something. My husband wants to be Oh, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> yes, yes, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes getting out the rage is what we need. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very good point, Kat. All right, let's dive in to purpose. And this is one of my favorites. Well, they're all my, my favorite. But what I love about this one is I have a riddle for you. Imagine this. There are three frogs sitting on a log. One day, one of the frogs decides to jump off the log and swim in the water. How many frogs are left on the log? You can put it in the chat or maybe hold up your fingers if your video is on. Okay, Kat says two. Karen says two. Uh, let me see if there's any more videos. Let me expand this a little bit. All right, so far we're seeing two. Seemingly, you would think that the answer is two, right? It, it makes sense. That's the obvious answer. Oh, oh okay, Kat is changing your mind. <laughs> Yes, because remember, this is a riddle, so it's never the obvious answer. If there's three, one decides to jump off, that would leave two, but here's the problem. The frog that decided to jump only decided that's what it wanted to do, but never took the time to jump into action. There is a difference between deciding and action. There's a difference between desire and follow through. So even though this is just a riddle, it does point to the truth. Because if we're honest with ourselves, how many times have we failed to act on our decisions and instead remain like that frog on a log? Or perhaps even worse, we failed to act because we didn't know what it was we wanted to do. Sometimes that's the case. Sometimes we don't have that clarity of focus. So what this pillar is encouraging us to do is to reflect on what it is that we're doing, but more importantly, reflecting on, on, on who we are. And here's another quote that I've searched, I've scoured the, 
the internet for the primary source of this quote. It's attributed to too many people. So I, I'm not going to attribute it to anyone. I think it's just one of those general life isms. We are human beings, not human doings. And again, I've counted too many people who say that they said it, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know who said it. Someone said it. We are human beings, not human doings. And this, I believe, has the seed of what we're looking for because it has suggests that we have two purposes. We have this inner primary purpose, which concerns our being and who we are. And then this secondary outer purpose, which concerns what we do with who we are, how we express who we are. And the challenge here though, is we often spend so much time just focusing on what we do rather than who we are, because that's what we've been raised to think. You know, as kids, especially as teenagers, what's the question on our parents' mind and on our teacher's mind? What are you gonna do with your life? <laughs> And then as adults, when we figure things out and we and we do things and we decide what we're going to do and, we, and we're doing them, what's one of the first things we ask others when we meet them for the first time? What do you do? This is what I do. What do you care? This is what I do. Karen, what do you do? Do, do, do. We're focusing on all these do's. And of course, we're going to pass over who we are. The challenge is when we focus too much on what we do on the outside, without thinking about who we are on the inside, well, we're gonna run into problems every time because what we do on the outside should really be informed by who we are on the inside. And when we do, we'll find that regardless of what's going on around us, it will have a perfect fit within who we are so we can live an authentic, purpose-driven life. The question becomes, how might we focus more on who we are so that when we do things, it can have that, that, that balance so we can really effectively express who we are? Let's do this next part together. I encourage you to close your eyes just to remove any, any outside distractions. So I encourage you to close your eyes and take a nice big deep breath in. Really fill your lungs and breathe out. And I invite you to think about your inner purpose, about the role that you serve in this life, about who you are. Now, if you'd like, you can confine yourself to the role within your organization, whether it's your job or volunteer work, or you could think about, it, you can expand it to your meta role of who you serve in life itself. For example, I, I fulfill my role as a human performance consultant, instructional designer, and facilitator of fascination. But these are, but, but my, my meta role is really to, uh, to remind people that they matter so they can survive, feel alive, and thrive. That's my really, my, my meta purpose. And everything I do is informed by that inner purpose. So my question for you is, what's your inner purpose? What role do you serve? Take another deep breath in. Fill the lungs and breathe out. One more deep breath in and breathe out. And now open your eyes. Take a moment, just jot down a few thoughts about what came to mind just now. Again, it might be about your, your meta purpose, <laughs> your, your meta inner purpose, or it could be if you're focusing on, on work right now, it could be what your role is in your, in your organization. I love to see you smile, Kat. 
I just recently learned to play the ukulele. I'm a trained saxophonist, but I find the saxophone is way too intrusive over virtual meeting calls. <laughs> so I use the ukulele instead. What I'm going to share with you folks now are seven questions that will help you focus on your inner purpose and outer purpose. I help, help you to, to, to find that balance, to, to work through that authentic character. And these seven questions are, number one, it's the mission question. And really, that's the one we just went over. What's your role? What's your inner purpose? If you want to think about it for, with, with your organization, what's your job title? Again, it could be your company's job title, your spiritual job title. Number two is the desire question. The desire question is, what do you want to do? So in other words, you know your role, you know your inner purpose. Well, what, what's a way that you can express that? What do you want to do with that? So that's the desire question. Number three is the value question. And this one just says, well, why is this important? So, so this goes back to the uh, to the ethos, you know, you know the uh, the the character. This is uh, this is about your values, right? Why is it important? Number four is the ability question. What can you do? What can you do? This is important because it really helps us to focus in on the. It reminds us that we're that we're good enough where we are. We we are enough to get started. We are enough. We we already have experiences. We have abilities. We're enough to get started. However, there might be a huge gap between what you're currently capable of doing and what you want to do. And in that case, this is also encouraging because then that fills in our to-do list. Well we know what what we can do and when we have this positive mindset where we can gain new knowledge and skills well on our to-do list fill in that knowledge and skills gap maybe it's attend a workshop go to a training get some volunteer experience ask for a promotion or ask to volunteer to gain experience there's a slew of ways to fill in that gap so that's number four number five the responsibility question what must you do and this is important for uh, many reasons. I'm going to highlight two of them. One of them is that what we must do when it's not in alignment with what we want to do, so one of two things are going to have to happen. We either have to delegate our responsibilities to someone else, or we have to change our plan to get there, right? Because because every time, any time we say, no to something that's the same as saying yes to something every time we say yes that's the same as saying no we can't do it all right so the responsibility qu question helps us with clarity and focus but the other reason this 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 question is important is think about this for a moment you will never be held responsible for something that you're not capable of doing that's a heavy one that's that's a big one you will never be held responsible for something you're not capable of. So this also answers part of the ability question. If you must do it, then you can do it. Number six, the commitment question. What will you do? And this goes back to that frog on the log. The frog wanted to swim but wasn't committed to it. All right, so the commitment question, what will you do? Just because you want to swim, that doesn't mean you will swim. What are you willing to do? This is kind of an attitude thing too, right? What's your attitude around this? If it's uh, if it's a drag to do, to get yourself motivated, you're never going to do it. But if you're excited, oh my goodness, if you wake up every day excited about it, there's a much better chance you're going to do it. The last question, the requirement question, what do you need? And this is a valuable one because it might be resources, it might be time, it might be new opportunities, it might be people, mentors, it might be support, 
there are a, a slew of things that you might need. And these, and these getting clear on what on what you need on the requirements can really help you uh, when 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 all the other ducks are in a row. If we don't if we don't hone in on also on our requirements, then that's also going to set us up to fail. All right, I'm looking back into the chat. Oh, Cat, thank you so much for for chat box. I I, I really appreciate that. All right, uh, I, I, I'm being cognizant of the time. I know that we had definitely allotted a full hour to, to this. Uh, so before we jump into the relationship pillar, I do wanna just open this up. If anyone has any questions or comments about the purpose pillar, or perhaps any comments or questions about these seven questions, you can just throw it in the chat box and we can address that. All right, I don't see anything coming in. These are all good. Need more time to sit with them. Yes, Ben, you absolutely hit the nail on the head. Um, with this session, really, it's 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 starting us off on a positive note. These are my note cards. My note cards help me uh, know what to say. I also have cue cards. If I forget what to say, I have cue cards as well. You're absolutely right. Uh, <laughs> this is really an overview. So taking time after today and moving forward to really digest these is very, very important. And again, what's nice is that there are just three and it's good to hone in. You don't have to focus on all three because as we did at the top of, of, of this session, we already know where our strengths are starting where the weaknesses are. And if it's two pillars, just focus on, on the one that, that is actionable for you, that, that you know, you know, I'm just gonna hone in on this one aspect. Maybe for you it's relationships, maybe it's purpose, or maybe it's mindset. Hone in on just one of these and really uh, focus in and start making positive changes in that one area. Oh, we have another question. How do you know what your mission is? Well. That's the million dollar question, isn't it, Vicky? And and that is something that really no one but you can answer that. Uh, but what I have found in my own experience, it's ways that I've been able to sift through the noise and the distraction is my own life is what what gets you excited? What sparks joy? What do you think about even when you should be thinking about other things? Uh, there's this book out by Marie Kondo called Spark Joy. And uh, I've had friends who have recommended this book to me. I finally just bought it. <laughs> so I, I haven't read it yet. Um, but the thesis from the book, from what my friends have, have told me, it's, it's really focusing on I mean, this book is specifically on decluttering your life, like your living spaces. But the way that I interpreted what my friends were saying about this book is what sparks joy? You know, if something is a drag for you, then you know that that's not your mission. But if it sparks joy, if it sparks passion, if you if you just can't stop thinking about it, like like for me, I just I'm really I'm really passionate about working with emerging leaders and their influencers, you know, uh, you know, to, to really help spread positivity, to help people survive, thrive, and come alive. And the reason this is important to me is, this, this is, uh, this is through my own authenticity, my own character. I went through a dark time in my life, and and Cat knows this. I went through a really dark time where I experienced a profound loss. I didn't have the internal resources to to really know how to how to handle it well nearly lost my life because of uh, depression and grief and suicidal tendencies. It, it was it was a really heavy situation in, in my life. And when I came out of that on, on the other side of grief, after three years, I was fa I became fascinated with how I was able, to manage that transition, to manage all that change it and come out on the other side. 
not unscathed. I'm a completely different person now. But I, I became fascinated about how I was able to do that and how other people are able to do that. And it sparked joy in me to understand the transformation I went through. But then, you know, it, it's sort of like if you hear that, if, if you hear good news, you can't help but share it with someone, right? It's like, so, so I spent over a decade researching and studying and gathering all these things and, and, uh, and losing sleep, losing, you know, just because, because you, because you, you just get so excited. That's the kind of excitement that I'm talking about. It's like, you know, it's, it's everything else is going crazy around you, but you're laser focused on this one thing. What do you get excited about? Vicky, what 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 makes your heart flutter and soul sing? What occupies your mind? What are you obsessed about? And it might not necessarily be what you're currently doing, or maybe it is, but just in in an adjusted way. I like to think of it as uh, the combination, the overlap between interests and um, interests in um in passion so it's idea of in in talent excuse me so it's what are you what what gets you excited what are you interested in but also your talents what are you good at like for me i've just i've always been good at music i was able to pick up the ukulele almost immediately that's just something i've always been been good at magic tricks i've always just ever since i was a kid i was able to do magic tricks it's just something that i'm good at so uh when I, when I went down this road, I realized, oh, magic tricks and personal growth and professional development, that's, that's my world. So it's taking what you already do well and what you're already interested in and putting it together whew, to live a passion-filled life. Oh, I see um, we have some more things. I love that you dug down into the purpose. Oh, you're very welcome, Karen. You're very welcome. In cat shared spark joy. My frustration is that nothing seems to have that spark for me. I enjoy things, but nothing I get passionate about. That's interesting, cat. I didn't know that about you. Hmm. That would definitely be worth a conversation. Yeah, I would love to talk 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 with you more more about that. You know, just just as a friend. Uh, absolutely. Because I know you as a as as a wonderful bright shining star, uh, so that's I'm fascinated that that spark uh, or that 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 passion is is elusive. All right, well, in that oh my goodness, that ties perfect. I just got I just got got goosebumps because this ties perfectly into the last pillar of positivity. We've talked about the first pillar, mindset. Your ability to gain new skills and new knowledge, having an internal locus of control where you have influence over your experience of your circumstances. As Viktor Frankl says, we can't control the circumstances, but we can we can choose how we respond to them. We talked about purpose. We talked about the inner and outer purpose, the seven questions to help us balance these inner and outer purposes. And, and also, we we really double down on 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 purpose on on mission of, uh, of identifying our talents and our interests. And again, this is all just a, in, in, an overview. I encourage you to dive deeper moving forward. But relationships, this is huge. I call this the fail safe. I like to think of these pillars as uh, using a metaphor of a sailboat. Our mindset is the boat itself. So the mind, so, so, so we get into the boat that keeps us afloat. So we don't have to splash around and, and drown, right? It, it keeps us alive purpose. Well, that provides the sail, right? So that, that provides direction for our lives that provides aim for us in relationships. That's the wind for our sails. So that's what keeps us moving forward. Each of these pillars are important. We need the boat. We need the sail and we need the wind. They're all working together. But without the relationships, you know, it's like being stuck up a creek without a paddle. Again, these are the relationships, the valuable social support that helps pick us up during our times of trouble. But they can also provide valuable social support to also celebrate when times are good. Yes, mindset boat. Purpose, sale, relationships, win. Thank you very much, Kat. So 
I, I am being cognizant uh, of the time, so I'm going to go over the the four main directions of relationships. I like to think of, of the relationships as a as a compass to keep with the uh, with the sail theme, you know, navigation. Relationships as a compass, where if we think of east to west, so if you were to draw a a compass on your paper, a big circle with a line going straight through it from east to west. That's our relationship with our peers. So that's, I'm just gonna draw this out as a visual, right? So we have our relationship with our peers, the straight line across. These are people who are similar to us. Maybe it might be the same age. It might be in the same job. It might be people who grew up in the same town. Our definition of peers can be very, very fluid depending on the, on the circumstances, but they're people who can understand us in ways that whoever the outsiders are just just can't. So then we also have, if we go from the middle of the circle down, let me draw this out. So now we have a line going down south. Those are our relationships with our followers, with the people that we support, the people that that we mentor, the people who uh, currently are where we used to be. It's the people that we help build up. So those are our, our followers. Uh, next, we have going north, the line going north. Those are our leaders. Going north, that's our, uh, it's the people who mentor us. It's the people who have, who currently are where we want to be. They used to be where we are. They know the way, they show the way, and they go the way. So these are our leaders, the people we look up to, our role models. I've been watching a lot of um, the old reruns of, uh, of Gunsmoke lately. I, it's, it's, it's my thing. And Marshall Matt Dillon, I don't know if you, if you, if you, if you folks <laughs> have watched Gunsmoke, Cat has. Oh my goodness, talk about role model. You know, he's, you know, everyone wants to be Marshall Matt Dillon. He does the right thing even when it's, you know, it, at his detriment. Our leaders, they could be people who we see every day, it could be, be, be celebrities that, 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 that we, we look up to. A lot of my mentors are people who write books. So a lot of people who mentor me are people that I've never met before, but it's through their words and their writings that I, I learn from them. But remember, I, I said there are four directions here. There's our peers, our followers, our leaders. The final direction of relationships is right smack dab in the middle. And that's our relationship with ourself. Our relationship with ourself, right smack dab in the middle. And this is an important one. And this also, oh, oh yes, Ben. Yes, I understand you, you have to go. Thank you so much for stopping in, Ben. A pleasure to meet you. So our, our, our relationship with ourself really ties back to mindset. It ties back to purpose. It's about having an honest assessment of, of who we are, our strengths, our weaknesses, it's a lot about, about humility. And, and humility gets also a bad rap, just like positivity, when we don't understand it correctly. Humility isn't so much thinking less of ourselves or lowering our, our stature, but it's being honest with ourselves and with others about our strengths. It's being honest with ourselves and others about our weaknesses. It's about putting ourselves out there at the appropriate times, but also seeking help when we need the help. So those are the four directions of the relationship compass. So I encourage you now, just jot down a few words. Which, which direction of, of relationships are you strong in? If relationships are, are your strengths, which direction is your strength? But also, if it's your, your weakness, also think about which direction could use some building up. Maybe it's your relationship with yourself. Maybe you don't have peers to turn to and confide in. Maybe you've achieved a level of success, but you haven't taken time to mentor others. Or maybe it's that uh, you lack the wind in your sails because you don't have the mentors to lead the way. Which direction could you use some help in?
And before we wrap up this pillar on, on relationships, I have three questions that I'm gonna share with you folks that can help build up our, our relationship no matter the direction, whether it's north, south, east, west, or, or right smack dab in the center. These three questions, and, and this is this is like, you know, you talk about gold, you know, you know, this is these are questions you're gonna want to ask yourself and others every day. The first question is that everyone wants to know these questions. Number one is do you care about me? We can't build a relationship with people that we simply don't care about. So how do we demonstrate that we care? If, if we're asking this question of, of other folks and if other people are unconsciously asking this of us, whether they're aware of it or not, people will want, will want to know, well, do you care about me? Do you genuinely care about me? Number two is, can you help me? That's the other question. And if, if we can help and if we care, then th that also answers the care question because if we can help, if we can provide care and we can provide help, then that is a way to, to demonstrate care and, and that, that we can help. So those are the first two questions. And the last question is the question that a lot of people jump to right away is trust. Do you, can I trust you or do you trust me? And oftentimes we, we skip right over the care and we get to, oh, this is how I can help. Or we skip over the care and we say, okay, how can you help me? But the question is, can you trust me or can I trust you? Being able to demonstrate these three questions, answer them affirmatively and, and demonstrate them authentically. That is what's going to help us build stronger and higher value relationships. And of course, the answer to these questions will be different depending on who the person is, depending on the context. So I encourage you to really dive into those questions. And with that in mind, we've gone like 15 minutes over. So I, I appreciate you folks really sticking with us on this. Kat, thank you so much for sticking all of these in the chat box. Oh, and, and thank you for putting the, the website in there as well, hashtag positivity.com. There are a slew of free resources up there, articles, videos, podcasts, a slew of free resources that, uh, that also goes over uh, all of these po points as well. So I encourage you, if you're interested in these, dive in, look at, at, at what's available on the website, on the resources tab. You'll be glad you, you did. And if you have any, any questions, feel free to, to reach out, say, hey, I was on your, on your call uh, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions or uh, share anything else. So thank you so much. It's been a joy being with, with you folks. Now, Jonas, can you also tell us how to find you other than the website? I believe you have a Facebook page and maybe some other means of following hashtag positivity. Uh, yeah. So if you go on to LinkedIn, I'm available there. You can search for me under Jonas Kane. I also have uh, a business page for hashtag positivity as well. So you can find both of those on LinkedIn. There is Facebook. If you look for hashtag positivity, there's a Facebook page. There's also a Facebook group. In, in, in the Facebook group, it's a wonderful a community, very, very in, encouraging group. So it's a great way to just maintain and stay anchored in a positive mindset. Instagram as well, the official hashtag positivity. Uh, we're on Twitter, hashtag positivity. And is that so we're hashtag on all spelled out? Oh, sorry. Oh, you know, that is that is a good point. Uh, Twitter only allows you so many characters. So I don't think it is spelled out. What I'm going to do is pop that into the chat box for you. So uh, it is spelled a little funny. But on the uh, Facebook and LinkedIn, is it hashtag spelled, spelled out? It. Yes, it is. Cool. All right. So thank you again, Jonas, for presenting today and kicking off the reboot of Net Squared in Adelaide. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We are so pleased and delighted to have you here. We hope that you got a lot of value out of today's session. I know I did. And please absolutely feel free to reach out to Jonas if you have any questions or would like to learn more about hashtag positivity. 
please make sure that you uh, join the Adelaide, uh, uh, follow the Adelaide Net Squared group. We have some amazing content coming up. Next month, it is going to be Decision Making with Chris Fern. So hopefully join us. Maybe you'll even jo join us back because Chris uh, is also a friend. Uh, he's a mutual friend of Jonas's and mine. So it'd be awesome to get the old gang back together. And it's going to be re really packed full of information. Chris has a really unique way of looking at the world and approaching the decision-making process and helping you understand how a lot of times we make decisions as if we are drunk and we don't even realize it because we have so much going on. So I think you're going to find that to be a fascinating thing. So Ryan, anything you'd like to add for the wrap up? No, I think that's a good wrap up. Thanks very much for being first cab off the rank, Jonas. Um, definitely very interesting. Um, and I hope you'll all join us for the next one in a month's time. It was a joy. All right. Thanks everybody. Yeah.